Welcome back, guys. All right, day two of our week two packet. Um, we adjusted the schedule a little bit. I know the pace was quite a bit week one, so you should be watching this video on Wednesday, and your assignment is going to be due to me on Thursday. All right. Today we're going to talk about how we see argument essays when they're in print publications. Now that you know what this type of essay looks like and sounds like, you're going to notice it. But we're also going to do that because we're going to examine the way that citations and evidence are used, the way quotations are incorporated into um, an argument. Because when you get to high school, the argumentative essays that you are assigned are going to include doing some research and then incorporating evidence and quotations in your work. So we're going to turn our attention to the article from the New York Times that's in your packet. Students who lose recess are the ones who need it most. Let's take a look. Students who lose recess are the ones who need it most by Jessica Leahy. Despite overwhelming evidence that periods of unstructured play and social interaction are a crucial part of children's cognitive, academic, physical, and mental wellness, schools continue to take away recess privileges as a penalty for academic or behavioral transgressions. I've done it many times. When students fail to hand in assignments or when a child acts up in class, I've taken their recess privileges hostage. I did it both as a way of punishing for bad behavior or as a way to carve out a few extra minutes of learning time in an otherwise packed day. Unfortunately, I'm not alone. According to a Gallup poll commissioned by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, 77% of school principals report that they withhold recess as punishment, even as they simultaneously sing the praises of recess as a factor in academic, cognitive, and social development. In that same report, 8 in 10 principals acknowledge that time to play has a positive impact on achievement, and two-thirds of principals state that students listen better after recess and are more focused in class. In response to this common disciplinary practice, as well as the overall declining rates and duration of recess in this country, the American Academy of Pediatrics recently issued a policy statement, The Crucial Role of Recess, to set the record straight and make recommendations to schools. Their stance is unequivocal. Recess offers cognitive, social, emotional, and physical benefits that may not be fully appreciated when a decision is made to diminish it. In other words, schools should keep recess on the schedule, and teachers like me shouldn't take it away. The physical benefits of recess to all students, particularly the 17% of American children who are classified as obese, are clear. In our increasingly sedentary society, it can be a challenge to ensure that children get the recommended 60 minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity every day, and recess can help bridge that gap. Recess also plays an important role in the ability to maintain self-control during class time. Self-control is not an unlimited resource, and by the time unstructured play rolls around, most children have depleted their reserves. They have had to resist the temptation to wiggle, eat the piece of cookie someone left on the carpet, or talk to their friends in favor of focusing on math facts. Recess provides an opportunity to refill children's reserves of self-control through play and expression that's free from structure, rules, and rigorous cognitive tasks. The Pediatric Academy explains, optimal cognitive processing in a child necessitates a period of interruption after a period of concentrated instruction. The benefits of these interruptions are best served by unstructured breaks rather than by merely shifting from one cognitive task to another. Several studies have found that students who enjoy the benefit of recess are more attentive, more productive, and better able to learn when they return to the classroom from a period of free play. Memory is also enhanced by breaks because cognitive rest after learning new material allows that material to be retained for longer periods of time. For optimal cognitive processing and memory consolidation, therefore, children need a period of unstructured free time, even if it is simply in the form of socializing or daydreaming. Finally, recess helps young children develop social skills, such as negotiation, social dynamics, and the use of subtle verbal and nonverbal communication cues. As our children's schedules become more regimented and structured, and free play time retreats indoors in favor of video games or kick the can and stick ball, recess is the only opportunity many children have to learn these skills. When I asked Michelle Borba, an educational psychologist and former teacher, about the implications of withholding students' recreational time, she was adamant in her support of recess as an essential educational activity. The highest correlation to school success is a kid sitting in a seat, focused and eager to learn. But kids who lose recess lose that and a lot more. According to Ms. Borba, students who are kept in at recess stand to lose 
Number one, brain power. Instead of being refreshed and ready to learn, they are brain drained as they have lost out on the opportunity to regain the energy needed for focus. Number two, connection with peers. Not only does the benched kid gain a reputation of being a bad kid, they lose out on the opportunities to practice social skills, make new friends, and strengthen existing friendships. Number three, relationship with teachers. When a teacher holds a student out of recess, she undermines her relationship with that student. Consequently, students will tune that teacher out just when she should be tuning in and learning. Number four, opportunities to learn a different behavior. Being left out of recess doesn't help a child understand what she did wrong, and even more importantly, doesn't help her learn how to make it right the next time. Without that instruction, she becomes a repeat offender, and a self-perpetuating cycle of bad behavior and punishment takes over. If we truly want our children to focus at their academic, physical, and mental best, teachers need to stop withholding recess, and schools need to protect it. Cutting into or taking away recess time is counterintuitive and self-defeating. When we deprive our children of the cognitive rest and physical activity they need to perform at their best, teachers undermine the very education we seek to impart. And parents, if you see your children getting repeatedly benched, you might want to choose a tactful moment and suggest that another method of discipline might lead to more classroom success. Or just click the little blue envelope, send this link to the school principal, and suggest nicely that it be passed okay. along. We're going to look for text evidence and quotations that are used in this article. So if you take a look at the page in your packet, how to use text evidence, you're going to see a few different ways that this can be used. Direct quotations, I'm sure you're familiar with. They're easy to spot because they use quotation marks. There's also the idea of using a paraphrase. This is when we put something in our own words, but we are summarizing or um, capturing a, a sentiment or a concept expressed by somebody else. Citing the source is important. Whether you quote or paraphrase, you definitely want to make sure you cite the source. You're going to make it clear in your essay where your evidence came from. Now again, we're not going to be using evidence in our essays that we write this week, but I want you to understand how to do this because you'll need to do it next year when you write more formal argumentative essays. Explaining why and choosing your quotes wisely I hope that's pretty self-explanatory. It won't do you any good to quote an expert if the expert is saying something about their opinion of the latest Marvel movie and your argument essay is about whether kids should have to get report card grades, right? You need to use um, good judgment and make sure that the quote you're incorporating actually helps advance your argument. All right, let's look at our um, opinion piece from the New York Times. The first one that I notice is this. According to, that lets us know we're about to see some information from another source besides this author herself. This is a Gallup poll. She tells us who it was commissioned by. And then everything here, this is the citation, Everything included in this paragraph is from this source. We've got quotation marks to let us know that this is exact wording from the poll. And we've also got um, her retelling. 77% of principals report that they withhold recess as a punishment. How do I know that that's a paraphrase or her putting that in her own words? Well, she didn't use quotation marks. So that lets me know that as long as she's a responsible um, author, then she did not plagiarize that and take their exact words um, without credit. Make sense? All right. Later in this paper, we've got quotations from the Pediatrics Academy. This whole very long, very formal sentence is um, from the American Academy of Pediatrics. In the paragraph uh, previous to that page, she let us know that this is from a policy statement called The Crucial Role of Recess. So there's our citation. And then here's our quotation. Notice the way that she oriented this in her sentence. 
the Pediatrics Academy tells us who said it, and then she uses the word explains. Those transition words are important when you're using in-text, evidence, and citations. She goes on to quote Michelle Borba. Now, most of us are probably not familiar with that name, so she explains this person's credentials. She lets us know that Michelle Borba is an educational psychologist and a former teacher. Then, whenever she does the quotations, we have some idea why we should bother listening to this person, right? It gives us um, a frame of reference to understand if that person is even worth quoting. Okay, we're gonna take a look at our um, in-text citation exercise next. Okay, take a look at your page, strategies for incorporating quotations. You'll see that the pieces we highlighted from the New York Times piece really do follow these same guidelines. And so this is not just something that we do in middle school and high school. These are writing strategies that you'll use any time you're creating something where you need to quote a source or show evidence, all right? You use a signal phrase to introduce the quote. This lets us know it's a transition, right? It's gonna let us know that you're about to introduce a new speaker or a source. According to, um, explains, you're going to, um, down at the bottom, there's a list of active verbs. This is a great list of verbs. Keep this on hand. You might want to use it next year as well. Um, you've got um, ideas like acknowledges, rejects, confirms, describes, comments, explains, observes, illustrates, implies. This gives you a chance to indicate the tone of the speaker that you're quoting and especially in an argument, it helps you build your case. Remember yesterday we talked about um, claims and counterclaims. So if the person you're quoting supports your view, you're going to use a different set of tone words than if the person is arguing the other side. Does that make sense? Okay, let's go back to where we were at the top. When a signal verb is followed by the word that, you don't use a comma. Um, Smith suggests that, quote, blah, 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 blah. However, if you don't use the word that, you will use a comma after your verb acknowledges, explains, illustrates, contends, declares, comma, quotation mark, begin the first word. Um, there's some good suggestions on here about changing your sentence format. I'm sure you have read um, writing before where it becomes boring if every word, if every sentence begins in the same way. You want to break up the pattern of the, the flow of your sentences. And so having some of your quotes, a few words of the quote, Mr. Smith explained, and then the rest of the quote. If you, if you change where your dialogue tag happens, that kind of keeps the reader's interest. Um, and then the last one is a really good note. Avoid standing quotations alone as sentences. You can do that effectively if you make sure you only do it once and if it's a really strong quotation. But usually for argumentative essay purposes, you want your building the case and the quotation is just there to support your argument and to help you back it up. So you don't want the quotation to stand alone because we wanna hear your opinion, your case, your claim or counterclaim or rebuttal to be what really shines through. Now, let's take a look at today's homework assignment. All right, you're gonna use the in-text citation exercise. Looks like that. I've given you four sources. I've given you a name or a, um, one of them is a website. I've given you their credential and I've given you a quotation that you can use or a fact you can use. Your job is to think of a way to turn those building blocks, those elements, into a sentence. I realize if you haven't done this before, it can be a little bit of a head scratcher, so I included an answer key. It is not the only way to construct those sentences, but it's one way. So what you might want to do is if you get started and you're not quite sure, have a parent or a sibling read you the example there for number one, 
and then see if you can think of a way to change it and put it in your own words and then work your way through the next one. You can use that as a prompt. It's not there just for you to copy so that you don't do the work at all, but it is there to get you started if you've never done this kind of um, pulling a bunch of things together and making it into a whole on your own, okay? Like I said at the beginning of the video, this assignment is due tomorrow. Well, you can work on it on Thursday, submit it anytime on Thursday. And then the next two videos for the week two packet, we've actually pushed to week three. Um, if you are loving this and blazing through, be my guest. You're welcome to work on them this week as well. I'm available by text or by email if you need, if you've got any questions or need any help with any of these assignments. You guys are doing a great job. Keep up your diligent, hard work, and I'll see you next time.